Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm actually surprised so many of you showed up this early after yesterday's great party. Um, so my name is Leon, uh, and today we'll be talking a little bit about testing, monitoring, production. I'm really awful with titles, as you can see. Uh, so I'll look at a slide about me. This is me. I'm pretty sure that was right after I wrote my first Hello World. Um, I've been doing this long enough that I hate pretty much every technology equally. Um, <laughs> and for many years I've been working on MUTI where I get to get my hands dirty with all the really big systems, which is really cool. I will have the slides posted on SlideShare, maybe with different background color, but uh, they'll be there, I'll tweet it out. And like Jason mentioned, spend a few moments and moments. Give speakers a feedback, not just for myself, but for everybody. I had a lot of great talks yesterday, right? There you go. Come on, give a little round of applause. There we go. Yeah, a lot of great talks, and some of them were first time speakers, so it's always great, either whether you're a veteran or a newbie to this, to get feedback, whether good or bad. So tweet it out, go to a forum, go around, and it'll be good. All right, so let me wake up a little bit. I hate that stuff. <laughs> All right, there you go. I got the follow. Um, and before some people rush the stage, let me explain myself. Um, I think testing is absolutely required. If you don't have some sort of testing in your pipeline, then you're doing something really, really seriously wrong. But I also think that testing is completely not enough. So how many of you, show of hands, have at least one of those in your development uh, cycle? Two? Three? More? How many of you still wake up in the morning because the pager goes off? You see what I'm going with it, right? Uh, so testing can give you full steps of security, right? Some people think, hey, I got all my tests passing, I push them to production, that's it, I can have a beer. And then, boom, the pager just goes off, and nobody appears for you. Problem with testing, it, it, it's deterministic, right? You're testing for X and expecting a Y result. And it rarely happens like that in production. So there's a couple of problems with testing. First of all, of course, it's a data problem, right? This is a whole, it worked on my laptop issue. So no matter how much you try, and I've had this argument with people many a time, you cannot replicate the production data in your testing world. You're either going to have that one extra record that's going to break a camel's back, or you're going to have some weird traffic pattern in production, or you're just not going to expect certain inputs that are going to come in production. By the way, I'm going to have a lot of examples here. So. This is personal. So who, who here knows what Wolf Plus 585? This is Wolf Plus 585. This is the longest known last name in the world. <laughs> How many of your applications uh, have been tested to support this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which of course brings me to the second problem, which is probably the biggest problem with testing, which is Users. <sighs> users. Everything would have been better if we didn't have users. <laughs> users then... <laughs> users managed to invent so many ways in which not only we haven't dreamt of, we haven't had it in our worst nightmares of the things that we do in production. Like, no matter how much you test, how much how you might you think through, how much how much you want to break it, there's going to be that next user who comes in and goes, oh, I wonder if they can break this even worse. <laughs> so, how many people here played World of Warcraft? <coughs> Come on, don't be shy, there's more of us here. <laughs> so, for those who don't know, World of Warcraft is a massive uh, multiplayer online game, probably. It used to be one, the best one, the most popular, now it's probably still in the top. And it's, it's a fantastic game, right? You get to play for orcs, for dwarves, elves, wherever you want to be. And they're also known for a lot of really, really interesting bugs that they introduced. Those who play in actually know. So anybody knows what corrupted blood bug is? Yep. So um, to get the game interested, the developers keep on coming up with a new inventive content with different mechanics. Can you hear me now? Oh. I will try to speak up louder. Is it better now? Oh, 
Um, yay. yay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take what I can. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, they tried to come up with uh, more and more meta ways and different game mechanics to keep the things interested. So one, uh, with one patch, they came out with a boss who would put a curse on a player in the group. And it would do a lot of damage, but the caveat there was if the player st stood next to another player for a couple of seconds, the curse would jump to that player. So if you're not careful enough, basically you wipe the whole party. Problem is the developers did not account for users. Uh, and what does the first user do? Is try to exploit anything they can. So I believe day two of the boss being in production, one user got that curse and teleported to town. <laughs> Mechanics of the curse were that the curse would jump to any player, either human or NPC. This is what Major Town looked like. <laughs> Bigger problem with that is the curse would also jump to Mopay if somebody died. And since the town had low level care, uh, uh, creatures, it would basically a curse that would, it would spread across the whole realm. They had to do a roll and restarts of the servers just to get rid of this bug because the servers were empty. <laughs> you could not survive anywhere unless you were hidden deep in a forest somewhere. It was it is actually defined as an in-game plague because it was really the same effect. So of the, short of that, of course, there's other factors why, now going back to our original topic, why testing is inefficient. I mean, there is always a lack of foresight. I mean, Y2K is probably the best example of people not thinking things through. Uh, there's always too many use cases that you can't or you don't check for. And I'll give you the last uh, word of work of reference. So when they released the first big dungeon for high-level players, about six months after they started receiving the bugs, the some players could not enter it. And to enter the dungeon, you had to jump through the window. And after that, you appear in the dungeon. And some players were reporting that they don't fit through the window. But that's not all. So after some debugging and looking through it, it appeared that the only players who couldn't do that are female torrents. And torrents were a class of minotaurs, bulls, who are supposed to be wise, the one with the nature. Uh, and female minotaurs were their counterparts, uh, which were effectively walking, talking cows. And the reason that bug was not noticed for six months after it went to production is because nobody wanted to play a walking, talking cow. <laughs> so nobody actually got it, and that's with millions and millions of people playing, got that specific combination of character high enough level to try it out for six months. Uh, and of course, there is a change to assumption, right? How many of you had to develop something for a use case, a launch to production, and then business said, nope, we're doing something completely different? So to summarize a little bit, testing is great for known knowns, right? When you're known for something, you can test for that particular case, and you're great. That's what testing was for. Uh, testing is OK for known unknowns. Like, to a certain degree of certainty, you can plan for problems. But testing is really bad for unknown knowns, right? You can't really test for what you have no idea. You, I mean, you can't test for user stupidity. Aha, finally we get to the monitoring. So why do we monitor? I mean, in case you haven't been listening for the past 10 minutes, is because testing isn't enough. But seriously, we monitor for a whole lot of different reasons. I mean, first of all, software is never perfect. And anybody who tells you they write a bug-free code, you can hit them with a stick because, you know, they're lying either to you or to themselves. Systems become more and more complex, and you want to make sure you keep track on every moving part. Um, there is always external dependency worry, which people tend to skip. Like, how many of you have dependency like a third-party service, whether it's major one, like a full integration with Salesforce, or just using Facebook Connect, right? And of course, it is all sorts of other reasons. But in reality, it can be summarized in one thing. We monitor because things change, right? And when things change, they usually change in production. So what do we monitor? What do we monitor to try to solve our problem of things breaking in production? Everything, right, would be the short answer. 
But uh, more specifically, we monitor systems, we monitor databases, we monitor applications, we monitor integration points, yada, yada, yada. I mean, how many of you monitor all of the things listed here? Oh, wow. We gotta have a talk. <laughs> um, all right, so question, is it enough? Right, is what you monitor enough to keep you asleep at night? Or is it too much and you get way too much traffic and way too many alerts and they don't let you sleep? So the question is what is important? What do we want to monitor really that will help us keep the systems up and running and quicker re react to them without overloading with information? What will I learn, right? So Twitter is a perfect example. Well, first of all, they're notorious for breaking things. But uh, a little while back, they had an interesting bug where you could go to the website or through the client, you could submit a tweet. It would say, great, your tweet is submitted. Everything is great. Site is up and running. And your tweet is going to DevNo. Right, so from an operations perspective, right, servers are up, APIs are up, they return to 100, everything is working. But in reality, it's not, right? So all the systems checks are fine, but the business is failing. By the way, that also goes for unit tests. If you rely too much on unit tests, it has the same problem. If all your unit tests are passing, it doesn't mean your stuff is working. But anyways, this is probably my favorite quote ever. It was told me of years back by uh, a CEO of the large company uh, when we were talking about some of the technical stuff that we need to fix. Uh, and that's actually very true, right? From a business owner's perspective, they really don't care what kind of technologies you're using. They don't care. I don't care what broke, right? All they care is if the business is successful in business and, and making money effectively. So we monitor because things change, right? We talked about it. But uh, changes affect business. And a lot of people, especially in the tech groups, either don't understand it or they're not previewed to the larger picture. I always a huge fan of the top-down approach when you hit, right? You monitor the business and everything else is just used to support those particular metrics. So in order to do that, you need to understand the business, right? You need to understand what are you building, right? Your software is only there to support some business objectives. It's not there for the sake of using technology. You gotta define the baseline. You gotta understand what constitutes good versus bad. And it's not necessarily binary. It's not necessarily, oh, it's up or down. It's more of a threshold, right? How many registrations do we get an hour or a minute? How much revenue is coming through the systems? What is the traffic patterns, right? And of course, you should be able to correlate the data because once you identify the problem with the business metrics, well, you still need to look at your system metrics to figure out what's wrong. So here's another example. Uh, and actually, I was too close to involved with this one. So one of the companies, they are actually pretty big. They have about 100 million users, uh, send about a billion of emails a month. Uh, they have 5,600 metrics. I think it's even more now. So they monitor everything starting from in-tests, out on their servers, all the way up to how many registrations they had in the past two minutes. So as everything, it all starts with a call, right? Where the client picks up the phone and says, something is wrong with the website. I mean, how many of you had that call with client or a business owner? Yeah. That's generally how it starts. So something's wrong with the website, and I was like, Great, would you like to elaborate? <laughs> and uh, the guy goes, uh, well, we'll look at the numbers, and our revenue's down. I was like, o okay. So I was like, all right, let me see what he's seen. So luckily, we were actually mo uh, monitoring the revenue. So as you can see, there's clearly a dip. By the way, we fixed it, if you look at the second dip, eventually. So, But you see, clearly we'll see a dip in revenue, but it's not like it's zero, right? It's just lower than the average. And at that time, we didn't see the other spike. So I was like, uh, OK, so maybe you're not doing your job and not selling enough stuff. Like, <laughs> what are you calling me for? I was like, but let, let me see. Let me do my due diligence, right? So let's look at the actual traffic. Uh, so look at the traffic, and it is lower than expected, right? So it's in line with the, the revenue they see. So you have less people coming to your website to spend less money. That seems legit. I was like, all right, but let's dig, let's dig a little deeper. All right, let's look at low times. Maybe performance, like something on a page, third party dependency, maybe something went wrong, performance plummeted, people can't check out. I mean, I don't know, a whole bunch of stuff can happen. Performance look just fine. So that's the first place where I could have just said, well, screw it. I mean, it's your problem, not mine. 
But it starts to take it a little deeper. So let's look at the database, right? Because you can send it, again, it's a Twitter problem, right? Something's happening, but it doesn't come back, right? Everything is fine with the database. Everything is fine with the systems. Everything looks normal. I mean, there's less people coming. There's less revenue. Sounds legit. Uh, luckily, we'll continue digging deeper and deeper. And finally, we looked at the email deliverability. And apparently, one of the major ESP providers, uh, I forgot whether it was Yahoo or AL, whoever it was, uh, accidentally put them on a blacklist. So all the marketing emails that were supposed to go to people in that domain, and that's a big chunk of it, bounced. So less emails got to their customers, less people got to the website, they made the less money. So that's the question I get off on. It's like, great, you were monitoring all sorts of cool stuff, right? And you were able to troubleshoot it. So what if we didn't have email monitored, right? I mean, we would have probably still figured it out at some point, but it would be monitored after this. Um, instrumentation is never done. Right? That's another thing. A lot of people think that you launch an application, you put a whole bunch of monitors on top of that, and you're done. But instrumentation is an evolving process, right? You discover things like that, you sure as hell put a monitor on it, right, if not alert. So we had an example with uh, another system which has very similar systems, except they had, had, they had higher decline rates. All of a sudden, again, it starts with a phone call, and I get a call and saying something wrong with our website. I was like, okay, what's wrong with your website? He goes, well, the decline rates are higher. I was like, okay. And we must have spent hours and hours going through logs, going through the database, going through rows, trying to figure out what's wrong. And nothing was wrong, right? And, uh, oh, nothing was wrong. Like, everything seems to be normal. And the next day, we come in in the morning, we continue troubleshooting, and the same client calls and goes, oh, by the way, could you create a ticket to take off the American Express logo from our website? I was like, why would you want to do that? He's like, oh, we stopped accepting MX. In the words of Wedding Singer, again, this information could have been brought to my attention yesterday. <laughs> but realistically, nobody, nobody would block the decline, uh, monitor decline rates from the beginning, right? I wouldn't even think about it. How would you, why, why would you monitor like, decline rates for different types of credit cards? Like, that seems overboard, right? That goes to that same white noise. But apparently, it's actual case, so we put another monitor on it. So, to summarize, I'm almost done. It is testing and monitoring. In no way I'm preaching to get rid of testing. Testing gets rid of most obvious issues of the whole, oh shit, I press on a button and everything blew up in my face. You absolutely must have testing. But you also need to have monitoring because, as I just showed you, you never know what you're gonna get from production. Understand the business. This is actually one of the challenges that hopefully the whole DevOps movement is trying to solve, is get all the groups involved. And for te technology people to understand the business that are supporting is actually going to help us to support. Much like performance and security, monitoring is not a feature. I don't know how to be. You cannot build your whole application, go through your tests, and then as an after so say, hey, let me put some monitors on top of it. You will fail in that case. Make sure the monitoring and instrumentation of checks is part of your development process. You develop a new feature, put a metric in. It doesn't cost that much, and it will save you at some point. It's all about continuous improvement, right? Uh, you, only, you, you never can ex cover 100% of the cases. Same as with testing, same as with monitoring. You can't cover 100% of the cases. So when you discover things like, you know, decline rates on a specific credit card type, put a check for it. Um, that said, monitor everything, but alert very selectively. You don't want to alert on every single metric because, well, honestly, anybody who's on call is going to start ignoring a lot of things, and things are going to start falling through the crack. I'm also really bad at conclusions. So that's it for me. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, 
Uh, the question is if I have a specific set of tools for uh, collecting the metrics and monitoring it. I have my preferences. Uh, the graphs that you've seen, we use Circonus. Uh, we spun out that company so we can eat our own dog food. Uh, realistically, any, uh, there is a lot of monitoring solutions out there. Any solution that will let you collect random metrics, whether they're text or uh, digits, would work, as long as you, you can correlate them later. Uh, some do it better, some do it worse. There's also Nagios, which I wasn't going to mention at all. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, realistically, anything that lets you collect non-typical metrics, I guess, because system metrics you can get from anywhere. But the business metrics, like the arbitrary metrics, the registrations, the revenue, all the stuff that you wouldn't think about it, you want something that supports that. And second part, you want to support the correlation. You want to be able to graph multiple things on a graph to see, or at least side by side. Uh, question is, have I seen uh, uh, effective ways to, pi to effectively pipe uh, alerts into the ticket tracker or something similar? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you have to be very careful with that, again, because you're going on a volume. Um, it, it's it, a lot of false positive, right? You need to hone your thresholds enough so it will be effective. So for example, uh, let's use the same example. You monitor on revenue, right? And you set a threshold. You, you assume. Any given minute, the revenue over the past row in five minutes should not fall below X, right? Well, is it really true, right? Does it count for like 2 a.m. when most people are asleep, right? And if you send a real low bar, still, like sometimes it can fall below. So when it does, is it a problem or is it an anomaly that somebody should get, wake up, look at it, and say, nah, everything is good, it's just slightly below it and go back to sleep? So. It heavily depends on the business requirements, right? If you can identify the metric that you know for a fact once it goes outside the threshold or once it falls to zero, let's say, it's a problem that somebody needs to look at it tomorrow, then, yeah, you can pipe it easily into the system. Because you do it the same way as you do with anything else, either with Victor Ops or with PagerDuty. Just pipe into alert and pipe the alert into your pipeline. So the question is, can, can I talk a little bit about responsibilities in organizations for monitoring? Uh, the answer is, for collecting the metrics, everybody should be doing this. Um, so developers, ops people, database people, even QA people, right? Anything, anybody who is responsible for architecture, for code, for adding new features, should be adding new metrics in. That said, uh, I also a big uh, supporter that anybody should be able to put an alert in. However, no alerts should be go, going in production and documented. Like we have in my company, all the developers have full access and monitor system. They can put as many alerts as they can. But if somebody gets woke up in the middle of the night and the only way for them to solve the problem is to call that developer, they're going to be really pissed. Right. So if you if you're going down that model, that any alert that goes into production should have a full documentation, full troubleshooting steps what to do, what to try, what other metrics to look at to see if anything wrong. If everything else fails, oh no, then you escalate. But to answer your question, uh, anybody really. Like, it depends on the business. Whoever is in control of application mostly, whoever is in control on on-call, should be able to put metrics. Uh, it's... I, th I think that that question is more of a culture thing, right? Uh, it depends on the company. I'm not a fan of actually making somebody completely responsible for monitoring, right? Uh, it's the same thing as when the don't call, right? If you put responsibility on the people who are responsible for fixing it, they become much more diligent at it. Um, generally, if you, if you had to put responsibility on somebody, I would say it's people who get woken up in the middle of the night. Because when they do and they realize there's not a monitor on something, they can go back to, if it's developers, they'll go back to ops. If it's up, they'll go back to developers and say, hey, I got this alert. I didn't have any information on this stuff. We need to instrument this. Right, so go, here's the ticket. Go instrument these things. 
I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it did. Okay. Maybe one more question if there is one. Uh, dashboards actually have very little to do with actual alerts, right? Dashboards, you want to show the information in consumable format. Uh, alerts, uh, when I say alerts, I mean it's something that wakes people up in the middle of the night. So you can show as much as, so the graph I was showing you, if you want to show 20 of those graphs with 10 things, and they're, if they're readable and actually show valuable information, then why not? Right, as long as you don't alert on every one of those things individually because any one of them may not necessarily show a problem. Right. When you put an alert in, it's all about actionable alerts, which is a whole separate conversation altogether. But you've got to ask yourself three questions right? when you put an alert. Do I care if it's broken at 2 in the morning? Right. Can I fix it at 2 in the morning? And can I fix it tomorrow? Right. And if the answer to any of those questions is, yeah, yeah, I can fix it tomorrow, then why would you alert on this? Right. You probably just want to send an email. Sure. All right. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes, right? Because it is iterative, right? You want to have a continuous feedback loop where you discover something new, you try to pull it back, and you determine whether you want to pull it back all the way back into your test suite, right? Because some of those things can be discovered during testing, right? Or you want to pull it just back into monitors and just instrument the metrics, right? And since Jason is trying to kick me off the stage, uh, we can talk about it offline. But yeah, there is a couple of things you can do with it. It depends on the model and what kind of organization and what kind of data you're collecting. Yeah, right. so thank you. Be something we can do as an open space, possibly, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's bring that up. Okay, everybody, put your hands together for Leon. Thank you, Leon. Okay. Appreciate it.